Well, now we're going to meet some really passionate and committed MS researchers. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Kate Milken. Kate is a longtime volunteer who's moderated dozens of panel discussions as well and produced several videos for the society. Kate, thanks for being here today. Kate. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So for the past four years, I have had the unbelievable privilege of getting to interview scientists and researchers. I've interviewed them at webcasts. I've interviewed them at ectrams. I can wholly confirm that they are very, very smart. I can also tell you, as somebody living with MS, um, that they are always thinking about you. Uh, it's a serious underlying mission and motive that I feel all the time. And when I started, their focus was much more conventional. And over the years, I have gotten to see this spectrum open up. And Tim Kutze is totally right. There is this new, different way of thinking um, that's happening. So let me show you what I mean. So I'd like to introduce the people who are coming in who will tell you more. Let's meet the panel. Uh, first, we've got Dr. Bruce Bebo, Dr. Albert Lowe, Dr. Lisa Barcelos, and Dr. Ben Dineen. Let's get this party started. <laughs> Hello, scientists. <laughs> so um, Al, we're going to go first name basis, because that's how we roll. Um, Al, I, I'm going to start with you. Recently, you had some research that was featured in the Wall Street Journal about salsa dancing. Uh -huh. Believe it or not, salsa dancing, here we are. Um, tell us a little bit about it. Well, I, um, who says neurologists can't be fun? Um, <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, maybe later we'll do some salsa dancing. So salsa is fun for some people, but dancing can be terrifying for others. I mean, you just have to go to a wedding, watch the men when the dancing starts, and see, and see who's terrified about dancing. But I, I think when you really examine salsa dance, it's actually a very neurologically demanding process. So let me explain. When you dance, you have to step forward, but you also have to step backwards. You have to go from side to side. You have to do turns. That's number one. Number two, the step count for salsa dancing is actually quite high. It's about 115 steps per minute, which is about as fast as the fastest speed on a robotic treadmill. Uh, num number three, when you choreograph dance, you actually have to understand some motor learning. And then three, while you're dancing, you have to interact with your partner, take their cues, not bump into people, so you have to deal with the environment like you would have to be, do it socially and listen to the beat of the music. So oftentimes in our initial study, I said, well, now dance with the beat of the music, and the guys said, well, what music? Because they're just too busy thinking about, thinking about the movements. Yeah. I think this is a, a great example where we try and just answer a couple of things. Number one is, can we improve balance? And I think our early studies have shown that we might be able to do that, improve ambulation, and finally, can we increase enjoyable physical activity for people? So we hope to answer this. If you can believe it, dance has not been studied very carefully in MS. It's been done in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And the National MS Society has funded one of the first studies, probably a clinical trial for dance. Wow. And not only are you doing something as alternative or seemingly kind of outside the box as salsa dancing, but you're also working with a robotic device. Can you ah, tell yeah, us about yeah. that as well? Uh, so, um, so the Locomat. So those of you that have never seen the Locomat. Um, How many of you know about the Locomat? <clears throat> Oh, wow. So some, so some of you, and, I, and I, we've met some people that have been doing this for seven to ten years now and described some benefit. Well, the Locomat is a big robotic exoskeleton. It's very much like that Tom Cruise movie that didn't do very well, Live, Die, and Repeat. It comes up to them, <laughs> and they're suspended on a harness above a motorized treadmill. And I think the benefit of this is it just amps up the intensity. We can get 4,000 steps per session versus 150 steps for a typical PT session. But I think the two important points about this type of technology are, are one, for MS, we're always thinking about the latest technology to test for people with MS. And I think innovations in rehab technology are, are going to change the way we think about function and re repair. And number two, as we've done at this summit for wellness, there is a um, continuum of research. At one end, among my colleagues, would be stem cells and epigenetics. At the other end, we're looking at robots and salsa dancing. And I think the purpose is, as we rebuild the nervous system, you need function to help mold the nervous system to make it meaningful. So we want a good handshake as we begin to integrate the entire process. And I think that that's an important thing about things like the Locomat. Awesome. 
Bruce, so from your perspective, kind of overseeing what's going on, can you talk about how these types of studies are different than, than past years and the shift that's really beginning to happen? Well, I think Al's studies are, you know, illustrates an interesting development in the last few years is this incorporation of technology and devices in, in enhancing our uh, rehabilitation strategies to improve the lives of people living with MS. And, that, and not just in the rehabilitation strategies themselves, but in monitoring uh, 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 both, you know, home, some of these devices, uh, accelerometers and so forth that we have to fine tune the rehabilitation strategies, um, you know, once they're, they're, you know, put out in the, the world. I think that the other change or revolution I've seen, and it was discussed at great length at the Wellness Summit this uh, last couple of days, is this understanding of how physical exercise can provide benefits for people living with MS. So there's, there's uh, early data to indicate that physical exercise can uh, help with fatigue, it can help with balance and walking, uh, even evidence that physical exercise can help with mood and cognition. And so what, we're, what we need to do moving forward is to accumulate more evidence, more data, do more studies to, to um, develop their best strategies and then communicate those strategies um, out into the world and incorporate them to help improve people's lives. And it, it seems, or it's quite evident, that actually there are a lot of people out there who are deeply curious about things like exercise and, and other modalities, right? Right, so we need, to, we need to, to understand what the best strategies are and so that people are using the best, you know, uh, 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 technology and strategies to um, use their time most effectively and get the best benefit out of it. So Lisa, we're going to move to you. You also were at the, in the wellness strategy meeting, um, yet your focus is in genetics. How do these two things come together? So I started working in the field of genetics 18 years ago, which is hard to believe, uh, in graduate school, and was motivated to do so by a close family member who has MS. And I've been working with my collaborators uh, at UC San Francisco and Duke University and Kaiser Permanente to study genetic factors that both increase risk for developing disease and also uh, genetic factors that influence progression and other clinical outcomes like age of onset and, and disease severity. And so we've been working uh, for quite a while on, on genes, and I can and say more about that in a bit. But we, we know uh, f historically that the environment plays a very large role in MS. And so about eight years ago, uh, I started working with <laughs> colleagues at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California to develop a research program that integrates both genetic and environmental risk factors as well as clinical factors and, and also including look at comorbidity. Um, MS patients suffer from many other comorbid conditions. And through that work, we've built a program that allows us to look uh, simultaneously at multiple risk factors, both genetic and environment. And so it's very exciting to see what the wellness strategy is attempting because some of the environmental risk factors that we're looking at are very similar. We're, we're using observational studies in large numbers of patients and controls, uh, for example, within the Kaiser Permanente Northern California membership. And we are looking at things like diet, and we are also looking at other environmental exposures, and we are looking at mental uh, health, and um, also uh, physical activity, and many other toxins and, and things like that. So to be able to participate in the wellness strategy is very exciting because I'm coming at it from a genetic uh, epidemiologist perspective, uh, doing observational studies and looking to see that the MS Society is really trying to look at these modifiable factors and to implement strategies to really improve MS patients' lives. How do genetics play into the role of MS? So that's in a, a nutshell. In a nutshell. Oh, it's a great question. It's a really exciting question uh, right now. Uh, in, in particular, uh, the work that I've done in collaboration with the International Multiple Sclerosis Genetics Consortium. So I would say of the 18 years that I've been working on MS and, and looking uh, at both adults and children, uh, the most exciting work that's coming is coming from the last 11 or so years working with the consortium. And through that work, uh, most recently, um, we have raised the number of genetic variants that are uh, uh, confirmed for MS to over 150. 150 different genetic variants have been identified convincingly to play a role. But the, the main point to get across is that none of these genes are um, 
enough on their own to cause MS. There is no single gene that causes MS. In fact, there's, there's um, a, definitely a genetic component, a genetic susceptibility to develop MS. We know this from family studies and twin studies. But what we do know is that it's not uh, a single gene, and it's very, very modest, large numbers of very, very modestly acting variants and different ones in different individuals. Um, hello, Ben. You've been very patient. Oh, yeah, you're a scientist. Of course you've been patient. Um, so you are known as a basic scientist, and um, you are anything but basic. Um, so tell me what that means. Oh, I think from a basic scientist perspective towards MS, um, the bottom line is if you want to repair something, you have to understand how it's built. Therefore, you need a blueprint. And the blueprint for the brain, the blueprint for MS, is extraordinarily complex. Um, MS is unique in that most neurological disorders have a neuronal basis. People focus on the neurons. For MS, the neuron insults are secondary. The primary insults are the immune system, the glial cells, the reactive astrocytes, the vasculature. So it is this extraordinary complexity that makes it really difficult to study to build that blueprint. So what's, what basic scientists like to do is to go back and, and reduce the system in two ways. Number one, to break it down into individual components, the glial cells, the immune cells, the vasculature, and then go back to the normal processes. How do these cells normally operate? Can we identify factors that contribute to their normal functions? And then try to understand how these processes are dysregulated in disease. I think a good example of this is, is or one, an example of this is stuff that I do in my lab where we use chick embryos to study multiple sclerosis. Yes, the, the, the stuff that's, the eggs in your refrigerator are not just for omelets, they're also for studying science. So what we've, some of our more recent studies in the lab, um, we've used these chick embryos to study extraordinarily complex signaling pathways that influence the glial cells, the myelinating cells. And so we can use the chick to reduce the system, to reduce the noise, to identify new factors and new pathways. Long story short, I'll sort of yada, yada, yada this, um, these studies resulted in the identification of a new compound that in animal models stimulates remyelination after, after injury. So we're really excited that we're able to take fundamental discoveries in the chicken and apply them to animal disease models and eventually work towards repairing um, the injured and the demyelinated nervous system. We hear a lot about stem cells too, which is another thing that's kind of um, been, been talked about yes. and circulated. In a lot of ways, stem cells sound hugely scientific and you know, vaguely <laughs> Frankenstein. Um, how accessible are they for people living with MS? Uh, and their cells. advancements. Yeah. Stem cells. There's a lot of hope and promise for stem cells. I, I, from my perspective, um, it's amazing that we can take skin cells from any one of you and in a matter of weeks we can make myelinating oligodendrocytes in a dish. It's, it's fantastic. It's amazing. These are things we could not do five or six years ago. So there's a lot of progress and a lot of hope for that. On the flip side, we have to be very cautious because um, when you go injecting cells into the brain or the spinal cord, all bets are off, right? These cells can start to grow unrelentingly. You're putting them into a diseased environment that is very different than a dish. So, and that is very different than mouse studies that have even been conducted. Um, so we have to be very cautious about that. Also, we hear a lot about stem cells for other diseases like the pancreas, the liver, like diabetes is a great example where you simply want to replace the beta cell to make more insulin. Well, the pancreas is not the brain, right? It's much more complex than that in the brain. So, we, so while there's been a lot of progress on this front, there's so, still so much more to go. And I would my advice as a basic scientist would be to proceed very cautiously with this. Awesome. Um, Al, so we're, we're going to you. Uh, do you want to do your salsa dance? <laughs> Not yet. OK. Um, so you've been focused on health and wellness for a long time yeah. and thinking in this kind of different mode. And you also took part in the health and wellness meeting yesterday. So what was your takeaway? Um, well, I think I could speak on behalf of the 60 plus clinicians and scientists that came to this meeting. I mean, we're all very excited, engaging, lively discussions. I mean, I think scientists and clinicians like to talk with other people about these problems. I think it's a very important topic. It's also very timely. One of the things we learn is when we look at social media traffic, 
the number one topic comes up is wellness. And so, so people want to know about it, but there's also an incredible amount of frustration. Why is there evidence? And I, and I think there's a good reason for that. There's no evidence because it's a real difficult topic. It's like asking the question, what makes people happy, healthy, and have a meaningful life? It's like the answers of life, but can we measure it too? As scientists, we've got to measure this. And it might be that extreme, but they're very in, intertwined. So I, I think it was a great privilege to be there. We saw opportunities everywhere. Um, the, to answer these questions is going to take a lot of different disciplines, which I think is the nature of the disease. Um, but we're really optimistic, and we hope to kick this off, and we're going to get some good projects going to start answering these fundamental questions. I was also at the meeting, and there were a number of people there who are living with MS who are alongside the researchers and, and, and really talking about it. First of all, one thing I thought was interesting was the fact that when you, know, when you talk about a formal diet study, how hard it is, even in the most simple form of you are going to eat the same thing for 90 days, make sure you do it, and don't fall off the wagon. Um, you know, those types of things where you really think how hard it is to kind of keep those, um, those studies really rigorous or whatever else. The other thing that I, I think is worth noting is the, the feeling of understanding that all this stuff needs science and needs to be proven, but also finding a way to address the idea of what people can do now in this realm because it's such an urgent need. And I, I feel like it's just worth saying that, uh, that that was a big topic on how to do that. And so it's kind of being addressed. But Bruce, to you. So you have an opportunity to see a lot of cutting edge stuff. So what is really exciting to you right now behind that bow tie? So I, I, find that, <laughs> I find that a really hard question because it's a little bit like asking me to pick my favorite child. Because there's so many projects, there's so much interesting stuff happening in NMS research. But I know you're going to force me to pick something. So I, I, I think the topic I would choose, and, and it was mentioned earlier today, is repair. I mean, the, the, the idea that we could repair lost myelin a few years ago was science fiction. I mean, this was fantasy. I mean, this was completely uh, 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 out there. And, and just a few years ago, uh, there was a revolution. And it was the discovery of a cell that, uh, uh, cells that live in all of our brains, everybody in this room, and it's called an oligodendrocyte precursor cell. Everybody say oligodendrocyte precursor cell. <laughs> Three times fast. <laughs> right. So, but let's just call it OPC for short, because that's how we refer to them. We just say OPCs. Now, these are cells we didn't even know existed a few years ago. They're abundant in our nervous system. 10% of the cells in our brains are these OPCs. And these are the cells that can repair myelin. And early, in early stages of MS, uh, uh, after a, an attack or an exacerbation, these cells migrate to the MS lesions, and they repair the myelin. And they do a pretty good job. But as time goes on and disease progresses, these OPCs start to lose this ability to repair myelin. Now here's what, what's really hopeful. Those cells are still there. They're just as abundant as they were before. They're alive. They migrate to the lesions, but they just sit there and they don't remyelinate. And we're starting to learn why they don't remyelinate. And there are factors that promote these cells to produce myelin, and there are factors that inhibit them. And we can manipulate these. So there is a clinical trial going right now for an, a blocker of one of these blockers. So it's sort of like the enemy of my enemy is my friend, OK? <laughs> and this is in a clinical trial right now. Tim mentioned earlier the clinical trials that were um, evolved out of the research that was funded by uh, Jonah Chan. There are three that I know of that are publicly uh, uh, knowledgeable. Uh, clinical trials testing repair agents right now, right now. So I, yeah. I, yeah, I think that's. So I, I think this is the most, I mean, there are a lot of promising areas, but I think this is one of the very most promising areas. I really feel like we will be seeing a repair agent sometime for MS in the near future. Um, ben, I'll, I'll start this with you, and I'm going to actually pose it to all of you guys. Is how do you see the scientific world changing? How is it changing? Well, I, I think. From the MS perspective, what, what's really evolving is, from, as a base scientist, we like to view things in isolation and reduce them. What's happening now with emerging technologies is we can understand the interplay between each of these different cell systems. As, as Bruce was alluding to, you have these OPCs that are in suspended animation, 
and we, and we want to understand how are the cells surrounding those OPCs preventing that. So the interplay between the OPC, the immune system, the OPC, the vasculature, the OPC, the reactive astrocytes, how these cell, cell populations are integrated and interplayed, and how that's dysregulated in MS, I think, is the fact that we can study that now and that it's appreciated, I think that's, that's what I'm most excited about and where we're going with this. I, all I can do is think of that song, you know, yeah, OPC, yeah, you know me. <laughs> it's going to be the theme song. Yes. <laughs> I know that song. Yeah. Can you hear it? It's on my iPad. You're going to be saying it different now. Um, it's a Lisa. Bad song. Lisa. So I can speak from the perspective of genetics and MS and, and how things will change from, from my perspective. Um, I think it's a really exciting time. I think we've we've begun to learn so much about the genetics of MS, which is leading to understanding more about the biology of what causes MS. And it would be very difficult to do that without the genetic information that we are gathering from some really large and very rigorous studies. We're already learning which pathways are involved and, and from the genetics. And what I think that will lead to, uh, in conjunction with knowing more about the environment and the modeling and the different things that we're able to do now that we weren't able to do even a few years ago, is that there are combinations that will be specific to subgroups of patients. And those combinations will play out in both determining how they should be treated and hopefully how we can prevent the disease. And I think right now, considering MS as four different types um, is, is um, not as accurate as I, as I think the picture will um, paint, become much clearer. Is that it's very, very hetero heterogeneous disease, and we are learning much more about those subtypes through these t different types of um, information. And potentially redefining them. Exactly. Wow. And I, I imagine that it will be not too long and, um, when a patient can go to the clinician and their genomics information will be there, and, and that will be part of how they are treated and diagnosed. Al. Um, I, I think along the lines of the integration of basic science and clinical science, I think there's been a big change with that. I'm mean, speaking from a perspective of rehabilitation, for example. Um, a few years ago, I mean, it was difficult to do rehabilitation trials, and now when we talk about wellness, we, we kind of incorporate Why was it difficult? You know, I, I mean, it still remains. I mean, this is one of the problems with evidence is that a lot of studies are being done, but they're not designed well enough to draw conclusions. Um, and that was just sort of how people did things. I think now, the game has gone up. I think we, um, the beautiful thing about rehabilitation is we, we think about function. A person's cognitive function, their physical function, motor function. So you always have to bring that into the, into the story, basically. This whole emphasis on patient-related outcomes can trickle down all the way from that down to genetics, even. So I really, and now rehab is being published in some of the best, the best journals out there, the highest impact journals. But I think as we talk about now, what I really kind of see is you know, we have the opportunity to, to work on all levels, even if it may not be the most exciting things, we might be able to do things in exercise and wellness today, and then as we kind of build up other promising reparative strategy, which may take longer, we can kind of hit at multiple angles rather than just one very specific perspective. Bruce. So I think I'd, I'd like to elaborate on uh, Lisa's comments because um, I, what, there was a, a, a publication that just came out a couple of weeks ago in Nature that was using this information from the, col the collaborative, the genetics collaborative, to identify those risk variants that are actually causal. The, that, the, out of these 159 now variants that are, are, are increasing a, a, a risk for, for MS, we're learning which one of those have the highest uh, impact. And it turns out all of them are immune genes, every single one of them. And this is getting at the heart of MS. I mean, this is, uh, this is the fundamental cause. And if we can understand the fundamental cause, which is the, the, the promise of genetics, and we're realizing that promise after a significant investments that we and others have made, and, and tens of thousands of people who've donated their, their blood and their DNA for this effort, we're really getting at the root cause of MS. And once we get the root cause, that's where we're going to be able to be in a position to end MS forever. Um, Bruce, our, our last question um, is, uh, 
uh, for you, what do you feel, you know, in the, in the world of technology and how things are moving faster, one thing that I found with um, interviewing researchers um, was a real feeling of, col of collaboration, a collaborative approach. And I think um, the International Alliance uh, for Progressive MS is a, is a great example of that. So can you comment about how the scientific world has changed in terms of that type of collaboration? Sure. So, so uh, Ben sort of alluded to it earlier. I mean, these, these problems are very complicated. And they require expertise from a lot of different um, perspectives. And so scientists, as time has gone on, and my observation, and now my 20 plus years of being in the scientific field, is it's gotten much more specialized. And so it really requires uh, focus on, and, and it's in a very specific areas, which requires, absolutely requires collaboration. And so I, I see much more collaboration um, now than we used to see. It was more competitive and less collaborative 10 years ago than and it's much more collaborative and less competitive but, now. And the scientists actually want to collaborate. They need it's to. Totally they have to. Feel, right? have yeah. to. Yes. Absolutely have to. Have to. Have to. And, and that's one of the things, I mean, that the society has promoted collaboration. We have specific grants that are designed to encourage collaboration, encourage people from fields that are outside of MS to collaborate with people that have expertise in MS and bring these different expertise together to solve important problems in, in MS. So we've recognized collaboration is important for a long time uh, um, and, and, it, and, and it's clearly important to get things moving faster. And uh, before we run out of time, I'll throw one out to, in light of the people that you're looking at, is there anything that one of you three scientists feel like they need to know that you haven't covered? Yes, an off-the-cuff question. <laughs> I want to see a salsa dance. <laughs> you cannot do it for two minutes. That is just not nice. Cool. We can teach everyone. But you know, I think, well, go ahead. I was going to say, at one point, I thought, with respect to what Lisa was saying about genomics, um, you know, these genetics, there's so many different genes that are linked, and what's going to be key in the next 10 years is functionalizing the genomic information. What's driving the disease, and what's, just, what's a passenger, and what's just along for the ride. I think that's going to be really important in the next 10 years. And we have the technologies to do that. Anything else? You know, one thing that I would say, too, is that whole feeling of um, the MS population saying, hurry up. How do you respond to that? Well, I, I, th I think one of the things that's happening now, for example, National MS side, because, for the sake of example, this wellness summit, because there's an emphasis, now funds are going to be directed toward that, which makes it a lot easier to, to really dig in and, and solve the problem. when. When, if there's not an emphasis, then it could be anything. So I, I think there's some direction from some of the grant agencies that help, and that actually facilitates things quite a bit because they can help direct things and get people together, like, like, like you mentioned, Bruce. So. Wow. Awesome. Anything else anyone wants to add? Well, I was just going to add to, to Al's comment that it, it's, it's about funds. It's about money. It's money. I mean, the grant to money and speed. I mean, the more resources we have to apply, the faster we're going to go. But it's not just about money. It's also about facilitating these collaborations and making connections uh, between researchers. And we are at the Society a really interesting perspective, myself personally and the folks that work in the research department that have the relationships with scientists and can make those connections. And people will give us a call and say, hey, do you know somebody that works on chick embryos? And I was like, well, I no Actually, guy. I do. <laughs> and we can make those connections, and that's, that's another uh, important aspect of what we do at the society, is making those connections to facilitate and speed up the process. Did I say they were smart? <laughs> you guys, great. I want to thank all of you. Yes, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Drs. Bebo, Lowe, Barcelos, and Danine. So thank you guys very much for taking the list. I hope you learned a lot. It is a very exciting thing to hear. And thank you for talking in layman's terms. Good work. <laughs>